Do you ever stare at a Wireshark capture and think, yeah, I've got no idea what's going on here? Don't worry, we've all been there. But by the end of this video, you'll see how to make sense out of those captures. So no more talking, let's dive into three real world Wireshark troubleshooting scenarios and figure them out. Okay, here's the situation. We've just opened up the firewall for a vendor to reach a new application. The firewall rule is simple. Their IP here can access our IP here on port 443. Sounds easy, right? Well, the apps team is just called and it's not working. All they have is a generic connection failed error message and nothing useful in the logs. We take a packet capture at the firewall and open it up in Wireshark. Let's see what's really happening here. We set up our filter for IP.ADDREQ 203.0.113.8, this is their IP, and TCP port equals 443. I don't see any packets there, so did they really try to connect? Well, at this point we could say, we're not seeing any traffic from the vendor on this IP or this port, and just kick it back to the apps team. But let's see if we can figure out what's really going on here. Maybe they're just going to the wrong port. So let's take the port portion off of our filter. So now we just have the IP. And again, nothing, no packets. Maybe they're really not connecting to us. Let's try one more thing though. We know that this vendor owns all of the IPs 1 through 255 in that 203 address space. So let's change our filter to ip.addr equals equals 203.0.113.0.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.
the subnet that you recently set up for them. None of these reporting machines can reach this server. This issue is urgent because the first set of reports are due to a client tomorrow. The server team has already looked over the server and tested it, and they don't see any issues. They note that every other subnet can access the server just fine. Any guesses on the cause? To me, this kind of feels like an access list issue. But we'll see in a minute that guessing is just guessing. Let's start by running the same pings the server team did, so we're all on the same page. Three of the pings work, but one ping fails, just like they said. So let's check the access list on the 192.168.3.0 subnet first. Hmm, nothing there. Okay, how about on the server side, the 192.168.2.0 subnet? Nope, nothing there either. Well, so much for our access list theory. So if not access lists, then what? Let's start from the perspective of the 192.168.3.179 PC, the one that couldn't ping the server. Let's take a look. We filter for pings by just typing ICMP in the filter box. We can see the pings being sent out, but we don't see any replies coming back. So we take a capture from the 192.168.2.25 server while we're pinging from the .3.179 PC. Now let's open up that capture. We filter for ICMP again, and we do see those pings getting to the server, but the 2.25 server is not replying, which is kind of weird, right? That tells us that the PC is doing everything it should, but something on the server side is failing. So what should the server do next? Since 192.168.3.179 is on a different subnet, it should be ARPing the default gateway. Let's see if that ARP is present by changing the filter to ICMP or ARP. Well, we don't see any ARPs here from the server to the gateway. Wait though, I do see the server ARPing for 192.168.3.179. Again, weird, right? That would mean the server thinks that .3.179 is on its same subnet. Okay, that's a big clue. Let's RDP to the server and run an IP config since it kind of seems confused about what subnet it's on. Looking at this IP config, does anything stand out here? Yep, the subnet mask. 255.255.254.0. That's why the server thinks that .3.179 is local. That's why the server was ARPing for that PC. So let's get this subnet mask fixed and test it again. We test it again and everything is good. Good job, we're on a roll now. Hey, the server team just called and they have an issue now. Let's go knock that one out. Just as you were about to finish up on some documentation, the server team calls. They just built a new server and it's working fine, except they cannot connect to it remotely with RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol. So let's see if we can get this solved for them and then get back to our documentation because it turns out documentation can sometimes solve problems before they happen. Maybe even this one. So first let's test it. We tried RDP from a laptop at 192.168.100.21 to the server at 192.168.50.21. And it doesn't work for us either. We decided to take a packet capture at the laptop, so let's take a look at that now. There's a lot of packets, so let's filter it down by port. We know the port for RDP is TCP 3389, so we use the filter tcp.port eq 3389, and that distills things down pretty well. What we see here is the source IP 192.168.100.21, our laptop, coming from port 50822 and going to the server 192.168.50.21 on port 3389. Then we see that same packet repeat four times. Our laptop is sending out the packets and not getting any responses. Are they actually getting to the server? We don't know. All we know is that the laptop is sending out the send packets, which is the first part of the TCP three-way handshake. There's nothing definitive here. So we go take a capture on the server and attempt to RDP again from the laptop. Now let's look at that capture. Wow, over 31,000 packets. Let's filter it down some. So we try tcp.port equals 3389 again. That's better, 
But let's focus in like a laser and only show the packets we want to see. Let's add to our filter and parentheses IP.ADDR equals 192.168.100.21 and IP.ADDR equals 192.168.50.21 parentheses. So we will see only packets that have those two IPs and port 3389 in them. So now what do we see? Packet 1890, the source IP is our laptop, and the destination IP is the server, and the destination port is 3389. It's a send packet, just like we saw before. So those send packets that are the first part of the three-way handshake are reaching the server. Next packet, 1891, the source IP is the server, and the source port is 3389, and the destination IP is the laptop. This is a SYNAC packet the second step of the TCP three-way handshake. Question for you. Did we see these SYNAC packets in our other capture on the laptop? Nope, we didn't. So what is happening to these packets? See the source IP on packet 1892? 192.168.50.1. That's our layer three switch on the server side. So let's open it up and take a look. We see type three destination unreachable and code 13 administratively filtered. This means something like a router, a layer 3 switch, or a firewall is filtering the traffic. And normally, the device that sends a packet like this is the device that filtered it. So why did this magically appear in our filtered traffic? Is our filter broken? Nope. It's because a Type 3 Code 13 ICMP packet includes the original IP header and the first 8 bytes of the TCP header. Wireshark sees that as a real IP header, so it shows up in the filtered packets. Now, if we look at the IP and TCP sections below, this is the packet the switch is responding to. The source IP is the server and the source TCP port is 3389. The destination IP is the laptop and the destination TCP port is 61015, an ephemeral or random port the laptop used originally. It is responding to our server SYNAC packet. That's what it's blocking. So to summarize, the laptop sends a send packet to start RDP. The server replies with a SYNAC packet saying, okay, let's go. And immediately after that, the layer three switch drops the packet from the server and tells the server, hey, I dropped a packet you sent and this is the one right here. This is why ICMP packets like this are such a gold mine for troubleshooting. An application like RDP won't tell you what went wrong because it can't. You'll never see this error pop up on a screen, but in a capture, it's all there. We SSH to the switch and pull up VLAN 50, the server VLAN. There's an access list on it. And when we dig in, sure enough, it's denying RDP from that server. So we change the access list, send it back to the server team, and they test it. It works, and everybody's happy. Could this really happen? Yes, unfortunately it can. And when we check with the server team, it adds up. They reused an old IP, and years back, they had asked us to block RDP on it for a vulnerability. The real lesson here, keep your ACLs and documentation up to date, or you'll have old rules like this coming back like zombies. I won't go into detail on ACLs here, but if you want a video on Cisco access lists, let me know in the comments. I think that would be a really good one. Wireshark lets us see and record everything. But as we'll soon find out, not everyone is having that kind of luck. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, stay tuned for part two of Wireshark Real World Troubleshooting Scenarios. That'll be the next video that I have for you. And if you like the videos, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.